I recently spent a few weeks exploring the Western United States, a seemingly endless world of geological wonder. While I was in Washington State, I visited Cyan, the studio responsible for some of the most fantastic virtual worlds that I've ever explored. I had an amazing opportunity to get a first look at their Kickstarter-funded Abduction, as well as sit down and share memories of the Myst series with co-creator Rand Miller. Before my parents bought a PC in 1997, it was always a real treat to play around on my aunt and uncle's computer because, hey, it was a computer. That was actually pretty exciting. And the game on their computer that most captured my imagination was Myst. It's kind of hard to say what it was. I didn't understand what was going on. But there were so many places to go, and as I poked at the game, I slowly discovered new things to see. Rand Miller and his brother Robin started developing PC games in the late 80s, releasing adventures like Manhole and Spelunks. Though quite different in tone from Myst, it's easy to see how Cyan's earliest works sprung from the same well. One of Rand Miller's earliest gaming influences was Dungeons and & Dragons. And it felt like we went to another place. Which was the part of the experience that most fascinated him. I didn't feel the need to do all the dice and the rolling and the monsters and the hit points and all that stuff, but I did build a fortress and I became the dungeon master, if you, could, if you could call it that, where I took a bunch of guys through the woods to this fortress and they played this experience. And looking back, it, it was certainly a seed. And then early text adventures got him thinking about the possibilities of how a computer can allow you to interact with another world. The exploration was not just the world, but it, you were exploring the interface too. You were figuring out what you could do and what the game could understand and what your limits were. Mist begins with almost no setup. You find yourself in a starry void where you find a book titled Mist. Touching the image inside literally transports you to an unfamiliar world. So you simply begin to explore. We just set people loose on the island. We thought that would be great. What we found when we started watching people play is they were, they were overwhelmed. They needed a little bit more, a first goal to kind of get them into the story. And so that's where the note on the path came from. We put that note that said, you know, go to the four chamber. They had to find the four chamber on the dock. After solving a simple introductory puzzle, you find a recorded message from a troubled man intended for his wife. I have to leave quickly. Something terrible has happened. It's hard for me to believe. Most of my books have been destroyed. Though little of this world makes sense at a glance, this initial bit of information got me invested in the man's plight and the mystery of this island. And then they had to decide which way they were going and what they were going to do. Myst held the title of best-selling PC game of all time for nearly a decade following its release in 1993, and received ports to consoles like PlayStation, Saturn, and 3DO. But my story of first playing Myst on my aunt and uncle's computer isn't terribly uncommon. This is a game that captured the attention of non-traditional gamers as well. We had something that kind of hit you in the face, like, wait, 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 that's a computer game? That looks almost like a photograph. I think another reason that Myst caught on with a wider audience is that it bucks several common tropes of game design, which may have also brought in traditional gamers. As much as gamers 
are used to the fact that they have to start over, that they die and have to start over. I think it was intriguing to gamers, especially, to not have to. Like, wait, what? I don't die or kill things in here? Okay, what is this? Myst presents unfamiliar technology and invites the player to figure out its purpose, which is a different sort of challenge than what gamers may be used to, but it kind of puts everyone on a level playing field. People describe Myst as both like an exploration game and a puzzle game. And to me, it's, it's almost the same kind of product. It's hard to have one without the other and call it a game. And if we weren't gonna use bad guys and dogs and monsters for friction, we'd have to slow you down somehow. And puzzles that were built into the environment worked great. And they also gave you this great sense of achievement. At least for the time, they felt much more integrated than what people were used to. It's like, you weren't just feeding a sandwich to a cyclops. It was like, okay, wait, if I think about this, I may be able to get this. Puzzle design is undoubtedly one of the more divisive aspects of the game and the series that followed, requiring lots of patience, careful in-game reading, note-taking, and experimentation, ultimately requiring the player to draw connections between abstract concepts and base conclusions on limited information regarding fictional cultures. I try, but I'll admit I'm not always the best at figuring it all out on my own. People are going to cheat and they're not going to cheat, it, whatever. But if they don't cheat and they get that great feeling of satisfaction, that's awesome. If they cheat and they look at the answer and they go, oh crap, I, I could have figured that out. We've done our job. A journal was included with Myst, encouraging the puzzle solving to happen outside the game. Whenever you give a, a way for somebody to write something down, it becomes part of your real world. It's not bits anymore, it's atoms. And just because you stop playing the game doesn't mean it doesn't stay with you. People would set it aside. You know, it's like, okay, I don't know. I, this is too hard. I'm not sure what I'm doing. The next day in the shower, it's like, boom, oh. The broad appeal of Myst is often considered a catalyst for the adoption of the CD-ROM format on home computers. I don't know which drove which. I think having Myst um, just as CD-ROM drives were coming out was a great thing because it was, people were looking for something at the store like, well, what can I get that would work on my multimedia computer? And the easy answer for anybody at a computer store or a software store was, well, get Myst. There's also a chance, if this all goes well, that I might be able to get you back to the place that you came from. The first sequel, Riven, was in development for many years following Myst, up until its release in 1997, and shows off an incredible leap in technology. There are sections of Riven that still to this day hold that, like, you could show to a person, they go, oh, it's a photograph of a little lagoon area. Like, no. I still have a lot of love for pre-rendered backgrounds because every angle and animation had to be so carefully thought out, which makes, I think, for some strikingly memorable imagery. The resources and effort that Cyan was able to put into Riven resulted in what I feel is still a must-see game world. A beautiful non-linear adventure across five CDs, where each island is its own disc. Honestly, my brother and I were not looking to get rich. It was like, well, we made a lot of money on Myst. We should put that into Riven. So we did. And we bought the same workstations that Hollywood used to build that. And they were expensive. And the software was expensive. And it was, it even that, it, that at that point, it was slow. We had to buy more servers to render that stuff. And it was, it was a tedious process. But, you know, it, it felt like we were doing some of the best work. We were creating the best we could. In the Myst universe, or rather, multiverse, there are many books similar to the one that brought you to Myst that link to other places. These are crafted using a technique that was referred to as the art by a collapsed civilization that was once deep underground on Earth called Denis. The man you help in Myst is Atrus, born after the fall of Denis, but having learned the art of writing from his corrupt father, Gen, who himself rediscovered the concepts behind the art through research in his ancestor's fallen city. 
The worlds these books link to are called ages. Mist itself has more ages to explore than just the island of Mist. Riven mostly revolves around a single gigantic age, and further sequels continue to tell the story of Atrus and his struggles against his family's use of the art and their treatment of the ages linked to from the books. I don't think it was till later that we started realizing the interesting parallels that of that, that they were writing worlds and we were writing worlds. A central theme of the series is a question of perspective. Are the writers of ages gods who have created new worlds and civilizations that they have a right to hold all power over? Atris, rather, holds to the traditional Denis belief that each book is merely a descriptive link to one of infinite possibilities that already exists. Though books containing contradictions and physical impossibilities may instead link to an unstable age. Well, we decided that was like, you know, QA. You had to, you had to, you had to get the bugs out of the book and just like we have to get the bugs out of the game. More can be learned of the Mist backstory through the book series, co-authored by Rand and Robin Miller. Mist and Riven tell a fairly complete story, and Cyan didn't plan to make any more direct sequels. They began work on Uru, Ages Beyond Mist, a completely different sort of presentation built with both online and offline play in mind. But Presto Studios approached Cyan with an idea for Mist 3. In Mist 3 Exile, the player has to track down Atrus's descriptive book for Relishan, an age he wrote for Denis survivors, which was stolen by a man played by Brad Dourif, who you might recognize as Grima Wormtongue from The Lord of the Rings. Mist 3 also introduced a striking new way to view pre-rendered environments. Some things were dynamic, they were still moving as you were looking around and live action characters were still in the scene and you could look at them and look away. And they'd be talking there and it was, a, it was an interesting feeling. Ubisoft developed Mist 4 Revelation, which gives a new look at the fates of Atrus's sons, antagonists of the first game. They set up an entire studio in Montreal to do the fourth one, which was amazing. With Mist 5, End of Ages, development duties were turned to Cyan, where they replaced the trademark pre-rendered backgrounds and live-action actors with fully polygonal environments and characters. They are perverted tools of the creatures. Gameplay revolves around communicating with strange creatures called Baro by discovering glyphs and carving into tablets. Though Riven was intended to be the original conclusion to the story of the Denis and Atrus's family, Mist 5 creates a new true ending, considering the events that occurred through Mist 3, 4, and Uru. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you didn't already know, Atrus is actually played by Rand Miller himself. Something that wasn't exactly his favorite thing to do. I did not want to do that. It was fun with my brother doing the first one and it was grueling even for the second one because it was in a studio in front of strangers and I'm too inhibited and it was weird. The third and the fourth were even worse because it was, you know, nobody I knew. Since the first game was such a small production, the Miller brothers simply played the characters themselves. But despite Rand's revulsion for acting, I've always felt that Atrus makes for a very compelling character. For reasons you'll discover, I can't send you to Riven with a way out. I hope they put up with the bad acting just that for the continuity, that's all. Uru's massively multiplayer online component didn't do as well for Cyan as was hoped, but against all odds, the studio still exists. Cyan, the company, has gone up and down, like all indie studios. We have rich times and poor times, and we'd gone through a number of those. With a desire to go back to their roots and give a fresh new take on the sorts of worlds and experiences that Cyan built its name on, the company finally went to Kickstarter in the fall of 2013. When are you going to do the Kickstarter? We need to do a Kickstarter. And it also felt like, even in popular culture, like um, there was a bit of a backlash toward the state-of-the-art 3D engines always 
being used for FPS games. So with successful funding, Cyan has been hard at work on Abduction, a spiritual successor to the Myst series built with Unreal Engine 4. Unreal has been unreal. It's been great. The artists love it. The programmers love it. Though Abduction is unrelated to Myst, the team at Cyan is prepared to deliver a modern interpretation of that experience. You're plopped down in an unexpected place. You don't know the background story. You don't know where you're going. You don't even know why you're here. And go. Enjoy. Figure it all out. But to me, one of the most exciting things about Abduction is Cyan's return to live action characters. A few people we've had in to kind of test here and there, it, it brings you back. I mean, it does feel like, wow, I remember this because it's done so little these days. Abduction's real-time environment also allows for some options in terms of control. Two kinds of gameplay. One is you know, for gamers, go anywhere, use your, use the standard controls you're used to for your shooters or whatever, and they'll work, and you can go explore the word world freely. But then as a little throwback, because once again, Mist is that way, we're putting nodes in where, we call them nodes, where, you know, you can just, you have a mouse and a button and you can play the game. Click, click, click. Rand says that the team at Cyan has felt reinvigorated by pursuing a fresh new project in the vein of what they already know they're good at, and are encouraged by all of the outlets that indie developers now have for sharing their creativity. It doesn't have to be a blockbuster to be a success, and I, I think we're going to appeal to a lot of people who want to try to get that Myst experience who never even played the original Myst. My Life in Gaming wants to thank everyone at Cyan for being so welcoming and accommodating. It was a great stop on my summer trip, and having a conversation with Rand Miller was so much fun. Thanks to you, Robin, and everyone who's contributed to Cyan's work, giving us some of the most beautiful game worlds ever created. And I hope many more still to come.